I'm Chris P, and a couple years ago I decided to get together with some artist friends and record our conversations while we draw, and maybe have a couple drinks or two. It's probably not funny, the audio quality is not so great, we broke the 180 rule and had to flip the master shot, but if you like listening to artists talk about drawing and shit that happened to them, then maybe this is for you. It's called The Tongue and Pencil. Hey, welcome to this uh, tongue and pencil. Thank you. This is our experiment. That's uh, JJ in the wings over there. He's, he's kind of become like a mascot now. He chimes in Ed a lot McMahon. in these things. <laughs> yeah. But uh, hey, uh, cheers, man. And uh, Ed McWoman. Yeah. <laughs> we got uh, Johnny Ryan here, who's uh, gonna, we're gonna bullshit with, and we're gonna draw some pictures. And uh, yeah. So I guess uh, let's get going. I might have to run away if I have diarrhea because yeah, I have the stomach fine. flu. All right, well, if we need to, we'll take a diarrhea break. <laughs> um, so, yeah, man, uh, I usually start off with, like, asking people where they're from. I heard you're from, like, Cape, Cape Cod, is that? I'm from Plymouth, Plymouth. Massachusetts. Right on. And how was that? How was that? Awful. Growing up? Awful. <laughs> it's a horrible so? place. It's, uh... It's, I, I grew up like right near the nuclear power plant. It was just a lot of shit kickers. It's a dump. How did, did that I don't, have, influence I don't have a lot of fond memories of living in Plymouth. <laughs> did that influence your, uh, your art in any way? Of course. Yeah. That's why I draw such horrible things. <laughs> right. Is there anything specific from your youth, like a weird dude that's made it into your comics or anything? Um, well, one of the guys that was in my comic, Lodi McGee, who had the buzz cut and zit face, yeah. he was based on a so this punk kid that I went to school with, who he was the only because I went to a pretty preppy school and I was pretty much a nerd. So this was like the one punk in the school. And uh, when he got there, he was he was very much a punk. He had like the the red buzz cut and he would wear misfits jackets and. Uh, yeah, and then gradually the the school sort of broke him, and eventually was he was wearing sweaters and oh really and uh, that kind of thing. But, he had like and he had like his, he grew his hair enough just so he could part it neatly to the side. He had like the opposite of many. But I was sort of obsessed with his sort of initial look, which was just like a complete <laughs> zit face with a buzz cut, <laughs> and he's sort of the inspiration for the Lodi McKee character that's in the Angry Youth comics. That's awesome. You know, speaking of the Angry Youth comics, that's like where I first became aware of you um, when I was back in New York that was uh, in like you know I would go to like uh, St. Mark's or Forbidden Planet or places like that to buy uh, comics uh -huh. and I happened to cross uh, Angry Youth and some other stuff ultimately and uh, thought it was pretty insane in a good way thanks um, man the uh now, I, I worked with uh, Peter Bag for a minute back then at MTV when he was doing this, like, hate pilot. Right. Did he, like, push you into comics or no, he, he into was, comics or something? No, he was, uh, he was important when it came to getting me published. Gotcha. Because I was, was, like I that. was living in D.C. at the time, and uh, that was, like, 1998. Yeah. And I was pretty much working in a hole. I wasn't really reading anything other people were doing. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. I wasn't really, whatever scene there was, I wasn't really part of it. And uh, there came a point where I was like, okay, I'm going to start paying attention to see see what's out there. And uh, so I went to the comic store and I, I bought some hate comics. And I sent it to, uh, on the back of hate, I saw that um, Pete would review other people's comics and zines and stuff and so I sent him my comic hoping that he would review it uh, but at the time but I didn't what I didn't realize is that hate was over and the mm -hmm. comics that I bought were old yeah <laughs> and uh, but he he wrote me 
very quickly after I sent him my comic and he, he was very enthusiastic and he said you know your stuff is great and it was kind of a breath of fresh air to what was going on at the time which was uh, comics were in a very sort of um, they were very desperate to be taken seriously and as literature Chris Ware was coming up and his mm -hmm. Hackney novelty library was kind of like all the rage yeah. uh, so very serious stuff autobiographical stuff was was very popular then and humor comics weren't really looked highly upon especially the type of awful humor that I was doing <laughs> so what kind of advice did he give you um, well he he was very encouraging and he he showed my stuff to Eric Reynolds at Fantagraphics and uh, Eric was very enthusiastic about it and uh, he showed it to his editors at Fantagraphics, Kim and Kim and Gary. They weren't too thrilled about it, <laughs> um, but they pretty much said, "Well, if you want to edit it, Eric, you can go ahead and do it." And so it was sort of like Eric's pet project. So they let him do it. And so yeah, I was first published by Fantagraphics. I first got my book in uh, Angry with Comics, published by Fantagraphics in 2001. So did they? Uh, so, but you were doing. Uh, you were self-publishing before that? Uh-huh. Yeah, gotcha. I don't know, that makes sense. So um, how did you find the difference between self-publishing and, and getting a bit with the, like, fanographics? Um, I thought it made things a lot easier. Yeah. You know, I wasn't very good at the whole uh, doing it myself aspect, you know? <laughs> like, I, I knew how to... I knew how to draw comics, I knew how to make jokes, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know like, oh, you gotta fold the thing this way and you gotta like make sure that it's like four by four and, you know, I didn't know shit about that. Like I remember like one of the first times I went to, to Kinko's trying to make a little mini comic and I just brought, I just think, like, the guy was like, okay, what do you want to print? And I just like dumped a big bag of like scraps of paper on the, on the counter and I was like, okay, make a book out of this, please. And they were like, no. <laughs> They said you have to, and they sort of like sent me over to a table to kind of like cut and paste everything, and I was like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. So I wasn't really into that aspect of it. And then, you know, distributing it, and because we did that a lot beforehand too, where, you know, living in Massachusetts, that was another bad thing about, you know, Massachusetts, was that it wasn't a real strong comic town. Um, there was a couple of good comic stores, like the Million Year Picnic in Harvard Square and stuff, but for the most part, it was it was pretty slim pickings uh, for a comic scene. And uh, uh, we, my friend and I used to drive around to the different comic stores uh, on the sort of uh, east side of Massachusetts, uh, all up and down the coast, and we used to go into the stores and I used to make like little handmade like displays to display the comic like oh, we, nice. we, would, we would go all out and I know I'm pretty sure that as soon as we left they just threw them all in the garbage. <laughs> uh, so uh, did you meet people on the internet and stuff like how did you get involved in... A lot of this was pre-internet yeah. or like very early eight stages of the internet. Yeah. Um, so uh, So how did you meet other people in the scene? Did you just did you go to conventions? Did well, that's the thing. Like I was, I was pretty much in a hole until like, I was making Angry Youth comics from like 1993 to 1998. Like pretty much in a complete hole. Yeah. I wasn't talking to anybody. I wasn't interacting with anybody. I wasn't going into conventions. Um, I was just you know cranking out the comics and taking them, taking them or mailing them to comic stores. Yeah. Um, that sounds like a hard task to complete. You would just, would you cold mail them? How would yeah, you, yeah. How or, would you know, I would call the store and say, like, hey, I'm, I have this comic, you're interested in it? And they would either say, like, is it a mini comic? And I'd yeah. say, yeah. And I'd be like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was very few sort of alternative comic friendly stores yeah. in that area. Um, so Fanagraphics was when you really started to get like uh, a wider audience, oh yeah, a wider definitely. distribution. Yeah, right on. So 
Let's take a step back to like, how did you get into just drawing in general? Um, I feel like it's just something that I've always done. I've always had a fascination with with newspaper comics and uh, cartoons and Mad Magazine. So it's just always been kind of second nature. I've always sort of excelled in my art class. Yeah, did you take any like formal art training? I was, for a, for a short time, I was a double major in college where I was an English major and an art major. Wow. Um, but then I dropped the art major to graduate on time. But then it didn't really matter because after I graduated, all that stuff that I learned in art, like I took, had to take figure drawing classes and 2D classes and all that stuff, it didn't work at all. Like I just had to start from scratch. Like I sometimes think like it probably would have just been better for me to just not have gone to college and just has, just start drawing immediately. I tell a lot of people you gotta go to college to realize you didn't have to go to college. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a, there's truth to that. Yeah, because uh, the, uh, Especially for art, you know, it's like it's good if you know what you want to do, and you it, and also if you don't, if you don't have like a personal style or you're trying to figure shit out, uh -huh. you can kind of buy time, like literally buy it, like give this college tons of your money, so until you figure out what yeah, you, you actually want to do. If, maybe if you're lucky, figure out what you want to do. I don't, I, I can't imagine what it'd be like to be a, somebody about to go to college now. I feel like that whole system's probably about to crumble. It seems like horrible. Like, I don't know if there's any future in like uh, a career based on, I mean, if you're like something real specific, like want to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, but like. Creative, these, for these, something creative, yeah. you're better off knowing exactly what you want to, if you know exactly what you want to do yeah. creatively, yeah. then just do it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, like, what's your earliest comic? Um, I did a comic about, it was a uh, sort of a, wasn't very original, but it was like a Sherlock Holmes parody. Yeah. Where, like, this character was the detective, and he was an idiot, and his, the Watson guy actually was the guy that solved the crimes. <laughs> so it wasn't, like, very original, but... The funny thing about it was is that the character's name was I Am Horny, yeah. because I thought horny meant crazy. Uh -huh. So I was showing my mother, I was like, look at this comic I made, it's called I Am Horny. <laughs> what, what did your mom think of that? They just were like, my father and mother were laughing at me. They didn't tell me what, what I So, So they done. encouraged you in this stuff? No. I mean, they thought it was amusing, but yeah. no, they never encouraged me to, to do any art at all. No. The, uh, how did you then... Did you just, you were just like, fuck it, I'm doing it anyway? Did you have anybody who encouraged you in that? Um, not really. I mean, I had an art teacher in high school that um, he knew that I really was into comics, and he uh, he started, like, giving me specific assignments to that were comic-related. Like, he would cut um, panels of Mary Worth out of the paper and have me copy them, uh -huh. which was pretty cool. That's pretty good. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's pretty much the only one that sort of was encouraging in that way. The, uh, so when you went to college for your, like, art and English major, that was it, right? Uh-huh. Did, did your folks, were they like, you should do art, you should do something practical, or was English practical enough? No, not really. <laughs> um, initially I went to... I was I went there as an astrophysics major. Whoa! And uh, <laughs> I kind of lost interest in it and wanted to do something that was more creative. Because I was I was pretty good at math and uh, like bizarre equations and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so did your folks? Your folks thought you were going for astrophysics, and then you were like <laughs> yeah. you had to drop the bomb like. No, actually, I'm gonna fucking doodle comic books and draw naked ladies. Exactly. And big, how did big hard on. Uh, not too great. Yeah. <laughs> I would guess not. Did you end up graduate? You, I can't remember. Yeah, did yeah, you I graduate, graduated. But with the English. Major? Yeah, English. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever use that for anything? Um, I got like a couple substitute teaching gigs. Yeah. That's about it. Did you, did, what'd you? And I did that classic comics club book. 
yeah. which was all the books that I had read <laughs> for my English class. Nice. Why don't your substitute, what do you, do you, do you sit there and draw comics and shit and you give them an assignment? Um, there was a couple, there was a couple of classes where like, the, once the kids found out I could draw, they would get in line and they, I would all draw pictures of them, <laughs> which they seemed to enjoy. But most of the time it was a nightmare. It was probably <laughs> the worst job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> What's the worst thing to happen in that job? Um, it was more just the sort of experience of it, because I guess the worst thing is, is kind of like you wake up, you wake up in the morning and you sort of like, you're lying in bed and you're waiting for the phone to start ringing yeah. for like their, them to call you in and say like, hey, can you come to work? Yeah. So you just lie there dreading the phone and then the phone rings and you're like, okay, I can come in. And then when you get there, when you're a substitute teacher, um, not only do the kids hate you, yeah. but the other teachers hate you. Yeah. So it's sort of like you're <laughs> basically living, you're working in this situation where you're completely unwanted and despised <laughs> and ridiculed and abused. So, for eight hours. So were you doing Angry Youth at that point, or was that? Yeah, I was doing it at that time. <laughs> so, but I mean, that was just like one of about five hundred jobs I had from, <laughs> from the time I graduated from college to, uh, when I started being an artist full time. Um, so, in being an artist full time, like, when did you get to the stage where you realized like you could live off art? Um, I had first, when I had first moved to LA, um, I think like after about two or three months of being here, I had a couple temp jobs, but then there came a point where I felt like I was getting enough freelance money from like Nickelodeon magazine and I had just started working at, for Vice magazine. Um, suddenly, uh, I was making like as much as I would if I was like manager of a uh, Burger King. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I, guess I, can, I guess I can live <laughs> off of this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was when I first was like, okay, I'm gonna try to make an actual go of making a living off of this. And I've always been really good at hustling jobs, hustling work. Yeah. Um, at that point, I never turned down work. Until I got this job at Nickelodeon, I never turned down any work. That's that's essentially why this studio exists. This is I came from New York, where I, you know, was used to like, hey, if a freelance job comes your way, you take it. And oh yeah. Moved out to L.A. and I was like, fucking, I would get these jobs and I just take them all. And mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck, how the fuck am I gonna finish these jobs? And then I'd have to hire my friends to help me finish them because I'm like, man, I told this guy we could get this whatever commercial done by whatever date and it's like there's no fucking way I'm gonna do it so it's always just like you know eventually rented this room and you know it just grew out of me being stupid and not understanding my own limitations right so I totally get that not understanding how to turn down work thing but I have I, I have a knack of like working really quickly yeah so I can turn stuff over fast uh, and thereby do more jobs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's a good skill to have. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, uh, your comic style is pretty distinct, right? I can always tell one of your drawings. Uh, how long did it take you to develop that style? Is that something that came right out of your hand, or did you work? No, it, 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 it took a long time, because it was sort of like, um, I kind of knew what I like how I wanted it to look, but it was just a matter of like achieving that. Yeah. And that took a while and it was a combination of things. It was, because when I started, I, w I wanted that sort of like thick cartoony line. Yeah. Like that smooth, nice, thick, clean line uh -huh. when I started. And I used to just kind of like draw the outline of the line and then color that line in to achieve that. Yeah. And then I started, you know, talking to other cartoonists, and I, I heard that, like, well, if you use a brush, you can kind of get that nice smooth line. And so then I started practicing with a brush. Um, and you can, if you, if you actually look through Angry Comics, you can kind of see that kind of transition of yeah. going from that weird pen line to me kind of practicing with a brush, and then, and then going into starting to actually kind of be pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, the other thing I always recommend there's there, there's two things in my career that I always sort of like recommend to cartoonists that I've that I've sort of I did uh, on my own which was uh, I started to do a weekly strip um, actually I did two weekly strips one was the Blecky Yaccarella strip which was like a totally like clean finished set up punchline kind of a strip and that kind of trains you to it trains you to come up with ideas uh, quickly on a regular basis and it also sort of it was a good training for me to do the brush mm -hmm. because I was like forcing myself to do that brush on a weekly basis um, and then I would do those comic book holocaust sketchbook strips uh, which you know they were they were totally sketchbook where I would just start at the top of the page and just kind of basically it was a jam with myself and that also trained me to come up with funny ideas quickly yeah and I think those skills are important if you want to do cartooning I That's recommend it advice. I recommend it if you if you want to <laughs> do this as a job <laughs> nice so which of like do you have a favorite book that you've done or compilation of your work that you like best um no <laughs> as soon as I finish something I'm like like I don't even want to see it anymore <laughs> like I, I even have a hard time like proofreading stuff because I'm just kind of like as soon as like literally as soon as I'm done with it I'm just like I don't want to see it ever again gotcha the um so in doing you know obviously you have your own stuff that's like you know that you generated when you worked with like Nickelodeon magazine or Vice I know they're like the opposite ends of the spectrum uh huh you know did you were you did they give you more assignments or was it still like just do whatever you want and then there's an editor who who decides well Nickelodeon it. wasn't do whatever you want yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. you know the yeah. Nickelodeon I was sort of the gag guy so I would just like yeah. pitch gags like single panel gags gotcha um, Vice was actually a really cool gig to have because there's Vice's Vice magazines in almost every country in the world yeah. and each one they share content, but they all ha all have their own specific content too. Mm. So when I would work, when I would do something for Vice US, I would also be able to. I would also be doing stuff for Vice UK or Vice Spain or like so. Sure. Like once I was in the Vice, the Vice editors from other countries would sort of be interested in like, oh, I want something. Will you illustrate this? Or like they wanted to kind of, you know, get me to do something original for them. So how did the uh, how did those um, countries differ? Um, was, was there like you know something like uh, Spain they they love buttholes or whatever? Was there any like taste? There was the, they differed in what they could show. Yeah. So, like I think at first Vice Germany wanted me to do with like an insulting German comic, but then they backed off because I think they knew I was going to do some kind of Nazi shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was more about like what they couldn't do. Did you ever uh, do a strip or a, even a single panel or even a drawing where you were like, oh, fuck, it. I finally took it too far and self-censored yourself where you're like, I can't show this to anybody? No. <laughs> that actually, like, if I have that feeling, yeah. I usually think like, oh, then I did something right. Yeah. <laughs> and there was, e there was even times where like my wife was sort of like, you can't. Yeah. You cannot like she would be visibly angry it's like you I, I you know you really can't do that one i really wish you wouldn't do it yeah. so what does your wife think of your comics um well she was one of the very she was like one of the very early fans oh. of my books that's nice. how we that's how we met was oh. that she was a fan of my comic and uh she was like started emailing me and uh we sort of developed a relationship <laughs> based off of that and then when she's like don't publish this one are you like that's what made you fall in love with me how dare you <laughs> i'm assuming that's the argument you get to not knowing your wife at all all right <laughs> so uh you know you've got like kind of two sides going on in your work it's like the subject matter often very offensive 
but like a really cute cartoony drawing style. It's not like, you know, super detailed, like gross out, you know, realistic style. It's like, looks like it's influenced by a lot by like classic cartoons. Uh huh. So how did that style come about? Um, well, that was sort of, I think, that kind of cartoony, because I was very influenced by Robert Crumb. Yeah. So that sort of kind of cartoony, uh, fun, classic style, yet mixed with hardcore, offensive, insane pornography. Yeah. Was, you know, that's what I, when I, one of the, that was like a big moment for me when I was at a Tower Records in Boston and I found uh, a paperback version of the German edition of his sketchbooks yeah. from like, it was like the, the prime time period of like 1968 to 70 yeah, or something I like have, that. Have those, yeah. And that is just sort of like, that book is probably like one of the masterpieces of 20th century yeah. art. Yeah, that true. that particular volume, and uh, that book sort of like kind of sealed the deal for me as far as like this is what I want to do. Yeah, those books. When I was in New York, I worked near this like used bookstore, and that whole like run of those sketchbooks, like the ones you know, they're like the thick paperback ones, and each one had like a different color, mm -hmm. and they had the years on them. Like they were for sale for some ridiculously low price, like two dollars each, and I bought. The whole fucking set of them. I was so stoked. <laughs> no kidding. That's a like, fucking great deal. No, I was like, oh, what? The? They clearly didn't know what, because they had like, like K, like I don't know what K says, but they had a fuck ton of them. They had mm -hmm. a lot, so they clearly were just like, what's this weird thing? Didn't do any research on it. And, right. Uh, and I won. The perfect storm. Yeah. Uh, the perfect they, used um, bookstore storm. Uh, were you quoted by Crumb at some point? Crumb quoted me. I don't know. This no, is on my. This is my crib. Right. This is on my crib sheet. The JJ. What did he say on the back of the, your your new book? Oh yeah, he he's not a fan of my work. Oh really? No. <laughs> um, he doesn't like me. I've heard from several sources that he doesn't like my work. So. Really? You know why? Um, no, I don't really know why. He just doesn't like it. I think he just thinks it's sort of like stupid, not funny garbage. <laughs> is that what he said, or is that what you're? That's what you're assuming. Um, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing what he said in the letter to me. Well, when he said he sent me a, a letter, and it was sort of like, after reading it, I was kind of like, I can't tell if he's joking or if he's just busting my balls or if he's serious. Gotcha. And and then. Uh, Eric Reynolds, my editor, was like, no, he, sound, he doesn't like you. He's serious. <laughs> I was like, why? Would he write me a letter if he didn't like me? He's like, yeah, he would. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, he writes letters. Uh, I worked on a, this is a, in the 90s, a CD-ROM where it was, it was like our crumb screensavers and I had to animate. I remember those. They were at the Buck of Book that I yeah. worked at. They so, were selling them there. So I was animating the cycles. Uh -huh. that of like whatever Fritz the Cat or Mr. Natural or uh -huh. whoever walking some thick-legged woman walking. Angel Food McSpade exactly and uh, <laughs> he actually wrote a letter not to me personally but to the CD-ROM company mostly about how much he hated Fritz the Cat mm -hmm. but that we didn't totally fuck up his uh, drawing style so I felt like that was a win <laughs> like yeah it was like kind of like Everybody else fucks it up when they. It's like he's writing guys. letters to the CD-ROM company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was a handwritten letter with a little drawing and everything else. Like, I guess he had. He had I don't know if he had moved to France at that point or not. Yeah, I guess he was in France at that point. He must have been uh, sitting in the countryside, hmm. looking writing at CD-ROM. Writing his letters to <laughs> CD-ROM <laughs> companies. I guess he must have had a computer. He doesn't seem like the guy who would have a computer. Somebody showed him. Who knows? Hmm. <laughs> You, you, you finally got to the point where, you know, you're like, okay, I can make as much as a Burger King manager. This is my job. But, like, I don't know if any of those other jobs or any other thing, like, could you see yourself doing anything else? Um, I mean, well, there came a point where... Uh, 
and I th I think that was around like the the final issue, one of the you know last two issues of Angry Comics, where I felt like I was sort of like spinning my wheels, and I was kind of like, you know, and I was like seeing on TV that there was a lot of shows that were kind of not that they were stealing from me, but they were using a lot of the same kind of ideas that I would use in my comics, and and I was kind of like I felt like I had reached that sort of ceiling when yeah, it came yeah. to a comic book audience and I was like you know I felt like I deserved a wider audience for what I did and I started to think like maybe getting involved in TV I mm -hmm. might be able to achieve that gotcha better well, on that note I think that's our pit stop like alarm look at this we're gonna switch out our artworks okay so uh, we just stopped and ate uh, we just stopped and ate pizza this is the first time we took a break in the middle on the tunnel pencil it's new who knows Maybe we'll do this from now on. Who knows what will happen next? Who knows? It's pretty loose. Whereas if you if you watch this on the internet or wherever you're looking at it, you'll know that uh, this is uh, you know it's not it's not very professional. <laughs> we're still figuring it out. So anyway, where do we leave off? We're talking about uh, other jobs that one could do other than uh, drawing comics, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you were talking about, uh, hey, maybe uh, maybe I could get into making cartoons or something. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's where we left off, so, so, right. something like that. So now you're doing that, mm -hmm. right? So uh, one, I'll, I'll, I'll start with one and move on to the next. So one I know about is the prison pit because uh, the uh, this uh, YouTube channel that this, this, we're involved in that one with those six point guys. Uh, what was that uh, prison pit like? Did you enjoy that experience or uh, making with with those guys at yeah, yeah. Uh, Six Point? Yeah, yeah, it was great. They yeah. they uh, they pretty much just took the book and ran with it. You know, they just kind of they took it. They took the book and they used it as a as a storyboard. Yeah. Um, there was no like uh, like there was no real involvement from me so much. Yeah. They just kind of wanted to take the book and and do it. Yeah, I thought it. It was uh, pretty badass. Yeah, they did a great job, and it was there was only like a few things where I was kind of kind of like, okay, can we get something that's a little bit different from the the comic? Because the comic was sort of some of the drawings were just like good for a comic, but when it came to sort of like that dynamic quality that you want with uh, animation, you, they had to kind of push it a bit. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, there was only like yeah a few times that they had to do that. Yeah. So that's a cartoon for the internet and new media and such things. Right. But now you're making a cartoon for the Nickelodeon. Yes. With, uh, Dave Cooper, who's a uh, friend of mine as well. And uh, how did that come about? That came about. Um, it was it was it was very long in development. Yeah, um, but that's normal. I think it was well, around like, yeah, yeah, it was around like 2008. Dave Cooper came to me and um, he said that, well, I mean, even before then, Dave Cooper and I used to do uh, comics for Nickelodeon magazine where, where he would come up with a couple characters and then I would write a story about those characters. Yeah. And then he would take that script that I would write and, you know, Nickelodeon would have to approve the script, but then he would do a drawing based on that script. For a, ser a comic book or a two-page comic based on that script, and we did that like three times, and then um, uh, a few years later, Dave was kind of like, uh, "Hey, you know, I pitched the idea to Nickelodeon for like a TV show based on those comics that we did. Um, are you interested in doing this with me?" And I was like, "Sure, what the fuck, you know." I mean, it was development, and they were going to pay us for being in development. Yeah, um, that's always good. Yeah, I didn't like have like an agent or anything at the time. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, but so I just kind of glommed on to what he was doing, and uh, so we were in development for quite a while. And during that time in development, we had made a three-minute short, and it's actually something that you can see right now on YouTube, which is which was pig, goat, banana, mantis. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think that like during that first first wave, that first sort of time in development, uh, we got to the storyboard part, and 
uh, Nickelodeon passed. Mm -hmm. They uh, they didn't like the the storyboard for the the pilot episode, mm -hmm. and uh, so they passed on it. And but we still had the trailer, and so we just sort of removed uh, any mention of Nickelodeon from the trailer. We put it online, and there was such an uh, enthusiastic response to the trailer online that Nickelodeon kind of was like, "Well, maybe we'll take a second look." See, that's a fucking and, genius move. And dude. see, and see, you know, maybe there's another way, another way we can approach this idea. And uh, so, yeah, that's basically what we did. And then from that point on, it took like maybe a little over a year until they decided to pick up the show. Yeah, I remember uh, Dave sending me a few years ago the, uh, the short and then sending me an email after saying like, fuck, don't delete that immediately. Please don't show it to anybody. And I, I did actually delete it. I didn't show it to anybody. I didn't want to get in trouble. But uh, it's good that you guys showed it to everybody ultimately because that's what reinvigorated the project. Right, and I think like, you know, I think there was that thing that happened with Adventure Time, because Adventure Time was at Nickelodeon, yeah. and then it sort of went over to Cartoon Network, and you know, everybody knows what happened yeah. with that. They didn't want to fuck up again. I think there was a, I yeah. think there was a little bit of that. Yeah. The, um, so how do you like making these TV cartoons so far? Um... It's weird. It's a weird experience because I basically went from working alone in my room for about 15 years to working at a studio with a full crew and people sort of looking to me to like make decisions and be their boss. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so it's it's challenging. Like it? it's, it's challenging to kind of like. Uh, and it's also like unlike comics where comics it's just kind of like you you uh, you have an idea you, you, whatever that idea is you put it down you execute it you you make it into something and then you you make a comic out of it and it's like a me almost like immediate yeah. cartoons are like so long and labor intensive that it takes forever and it's, it takes forever, <laughs> it takes forever. Yeah. a lot of people don't realize it takes forever yeah. You know, unless it's like South Park or yeah. something, it, it literally. People always complain, like fans will be like, "When is the next season of this show coming out? It takes you guys so fucking long to make." Mm -hmm. And it's true, it does take a long time. And South Park, speaking of South Park, that documentary on South Park, fucking worst thing in the world. Oh, I never saw that. Concerned. I mean, it's a great documentary, but it's the worst for when we have to deal with clients and they're like, "I saw that South Park documentary, and they can make a TV show in a week." Right. And it's just such a weird anomaly of like, yeah, well, you know, they're on their like 15th, 16th season of having a bunch of assets and it's a well-oiled machine of making it good and those guys are great and they also let them do whatever they want at this stage, which is a big and, part well, of Plus it's all just cutouts too. It's yeah, like exactly. it doesn't have any kind of, yeah. which is nothing wrong with that, but it's just kind of that's what makes it easier for them to do that uh, show and also you know when you have a style that's that's like that the writing has to be up to par in yeah. order to achieve that kind of South Park totally. quality yeah but, that's not uh, gonna work every time it's true uh, so it's different is it something you enjoy yes <laughs> all right you did it success I mean I, I enjoy making a living <laughs> yeah. at at you know writing funny stuff yeah um but you know there's there's downsides too which is like i i'm, I'm i sort of have trained myself to receive uh an immediate response yeah and to have to wait so long and like to have to be part of that whole process of like waiting and relying on others to successfully execute your your visions yeah is challenging yeah that's weird that getting into dealing with a crew working with a bunch of other people collaborating is always tough when you're used to you're like well i could totally just do this but then the the scale at which you have to operate and then the the different bosses you have to please on such a thing or 
it's tough to do it all yourself. Um, remember, uh, Beavis and Butthead had come out when I was at the tail end of going to school, and then I ended up getting like one of my first gigs was working on Beavis and Butthead. And I remember when I was in school, I was like, man, I could fucking make that. Like, why do I even need a crew? Like, I can just make that whole show myself. And then you start working on it, you kind of realize how many people have to be involved to make a TV show. It seems. Mm -hmm. Like it would be easy from the outside, and then once you get into it, you're like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a lot of crazy moving parts to this stuff. Yeah, uh, and not all of them good, <laughs> but uh, you know, I guess somewhat necessary. I don't know. Pig Goat Banana Cricket is the name, right? Uh huh. And then was that always the name? No, it was initially yeah. Pig Goat Banana Mantis, but yeah. they had a mantis on Kung Fu Panda. Uh, which was on Nickelodeon at the time, so they... So that's why they make those decisions. Yeah. Uh, but now it's not on Nickelodeon. And then it doesn't matter But now it does who gives a shit. That's the thing. That's why it's tough to listen to that stuff, and sometimes you have to, but then a lot of times those decisions don't matter. It's one of those reasons I really like Adult Swim, because remember when we were uh, doing the first season of Metalocalypse, there's a character called Murderface. Mm -hmm. And then there was another show... Um, called Frisky Dingo that was coming up at the same time and they had a, a character called Killface and one of the intermediate executives was like oh, I, I gotta check and make sure that this uh, you know this is not an issue because I don't know if we can have uh, two shows one with a uh, murder face and one with a kill face and uh, when it got up to Mike Lazo who is uh, a smart dude and a friend of the artist he was like what the fuck does it matter <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Who cares? Who cares? You know, it's a not issue, and we both and nobody cares. He right. was absolutely right. You know? So uh, yeah, but you get into those things where, where people think and they second guess and they are afraid. And a lot of stuff, uh, you know, they make a lot of decisions based on that stuff. So um, to go back to uh, you know, kind of the comic stuff. Um, you know, Prison Pit, we talked about that was kind of a departure from your, like, straight-up comedy stuff. But uh, one of my favorite kind of, like, uh, I guess, uh, titles, if you'll call it that, is your ho comic book Holocaust stuff. Mm -hmm. Because that really feels like you're 100% untethered in that you just, from the outside, it seems like whatever pops in your mind you draw onto a piece of paper. Right. How does that process work? Um, well, like I said before, it was just kind of a jam comic with myself. So yeah. I would, with the comic book Holocaust, the theme was just making fun of people's comics. So yeah. I would just come start at the top of the page, you know, uh, Garfield, yeah. and then uh, come up with a funny name for Garfield. Yeah. I don't know what I did <laughs> Barfield I don't remember what I did but uh, and then I would just kind of like have a general idea of where to start and I would try not to concern myself with like how the panel looked if it was a good looking if it made sense yeah. I would just start at the top and just work my way down as quickly as I could and try to think of the weirdest funniest things I could until I got to the end That's um, great. and usually I would kind of wind up writing myself into corners that I would then have to write myself out of. Yeah. But I, all that was sort of a good exercise. Yeah. It seems for like it for uh, writing. The um the one thing that always amazed me about that as far as like being so you that was that Fanographics ultimately published through No, the, that was self published? That was published by Buenaventura Press. Ah, gotcha. Um, they published the three volumes of my sketchbook comics which was first the comic book holocaust then was the classic comics club yeah and then was the new character parade so um the thing that i thought about because now that i got this company and business shit and have to think about insurance and liability and stuff is like what did you have to go through like legal clearance wise to get that book on the shelves was there any concern of like Oh, you're gonna get sued by these people who no, have because I just figured everything that I was doing in that book was done in Mad Magazine. Yeah, I wasn't doing anything that Mad Magazine didn't do. Yeah. so it was I considered it a parody. 
in parody, as far as I know, is legal. Yeah, I I agree. In TV cartoons, man, I think it's the lawyer's job to say no to everything right out of the gate. And uh, I've had to have that conversation with some producers and stuff. It's like, man, we should fight this because... Of course the lawyer's going to say no. It's easier to say no than uh -huh. to do the research to see if we can legally do this stuff. And, uh, yeah, I was super impressed by those books and just, like, the freedom of, like, fucking with everybody. And, uh, you know, there's what's legal, I guess, and then a lot of times what I get back from um, these lawyers at the, the networks and stuff is like, yeah, you can legally do that, but this company is very litigious and their lawyers will sue even though they don't have any legal ground to yeah I think on. it's it's a lot of times it's just um, it's more about scaring people yeah totally. like they don't even have to have a case yeah. all they have to do is like have the threat of, of a lawsuit and then people will back down totally. just because they don't want to, the hassle of it yep. um, but I think that what I did was like on such a small potato scale that nobody cared you know, yeah, yeah, when it yeah, comes to comics, yeah. nobody cares. That's Especially true. the type of comics that I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's real, it's real small change. It's true. So, but do you, I wonder if, you know, some kid, you know, whatever, like Avenger is super big now or whatever. Some kid does a Google search on the Incredible Hulk or Captain America or something like that, runs across something like that. Mm -hmm. Is some lawyer going to get up in arms? Uh, who knows? You mean at this point? So, yeah, yeah, at this point. <laughs> who knows? Um, the, uh, like 10 years later? To, uh, and I don't know if this is true or this is hearsay, but that's what this is for, right? Is to ask you questions directly. But I heard that Nickelodeon uh, was uh, hesitant in using your full name as a credit in... Uh, um, well, I in think that's show. since changed. Oh, okay. Like, I think initially that was part of the deal right on. was that they were just going to alter my name to Jay Ryan yeah but I think that they've since decided that that wasn't necessary oh that's good which is kind of cool yeah that's, that's um, I actually thought that by altering my name it actually brought more attention to yeah yeah the fact <laughs> exactly and <laughs> not to mention they didn't change Dave Cooper's name which I think like yeah he's I mean, done he draws like deformed naked he, he's done stuff that's I think stuff. even filthier than I've ever done <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, his stuff, I think, even has sort of, like, an erotic tinge to it, where mine is just for laughs. Yeah. <laughs> it is, there seems to be, and it, it, I was interested in tracking that, because, you know, in a lot of industries, uh, or a lot of even disciplines of entertainment, like, if you do something that's for an adult audience, it's tough to do something for a kid's audience, but it does seem like, like, cartoonists and animators seem to be able to get away with that it might be because we're not taken seriously like you know dr seuss made dirty books like john k mm -hmm. ralph Bakshi. there's a whole history of people doing like dirty comics or like adult stuff and then also totally doing kid stuff so um, i'm glad to hear that they're letting you use your real name or yeah. not your truncated version of your real name, right. <laughs> at least. No, Nickelodeon's been been pretty cool. You know, I have to give them that, that they, they've they been pretty cool to work with. And, you know, just making this show and a lot of the stuff that we've been able to do, the, the creativity that they've allowed us within the parameters of, like, a children's show yeah. has, been, has been pretty uh, exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that that's a good thing too with kids shows is like sometimes you can get away with some real weird shit because mm -hmm. kids they like weird shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I liked it when I was a kid. I think yeah, me too. And that's sort of like where we're coming from. Like I, I don't even when I'm making this show, I don't think like I'm making a show for 11 to 13 year olds, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm making a show that I find is funny within the parameters that I'm allowed to make the show. Yeah. So, you know, they give me a certain set of rules like you just don't do this this and this and try to ma make something funny do you remember do it and so then specific i specific rules that you could think of or is it um you know like we can't do fire mm. there are there's like lots of safety stuff broken glass and yeah. there's certain words we can't really say anymore stupid uh, that's one i know like well anything that sort of may be be mean like yeah. the mean like 
I don't even know if they could show Ren and Stimpy on Nickelodeon yeah. anymore because yeah, that's true. That that cartoon <laughs> is just sort of like the embodiment of mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that sort of meanness is is something that we we can't really do anymore. Yeah. Uh, do you have the desire to do mean characters? Um. Well, you can do you can kind of do mean. It's it's harder to do the mean characters when it's sort of like the friends being yeah. mean to each other, or or the main character being mean to somebody else. Yeah. Like the main characters being mean is sort of looked down upon, but like villains and side characters that do mean questionable stuff is a little bit they're a little bit more forgiving of that. Yeah, bad um, guys can be mean, right? right? Bad guys can be mean, um, that kind of thing. So uh, we can do that. Um, but yeah, the the main characters being mean is is not really looked highly upon. Yeah, <laughs> they don't really like that. So um, I heard again through hearsay. Again, this is what it is that uh, you might have had uh, picketers at a gallery show recently. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't recent. That was a few years ago. Oh, okay. That was at my last Mishka show. Yeah. At uh, Mishka here in L.A. What happened? Uh, What's the story behind that? Um, my friend Greg, who runs that store slash gallery, he asked me if I uh, if I had anything for a show. I really didn't, but at the time I was sort of taking uh, chick tracks. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know if you know yeah, what Jack those are. Jack yeah. chick tracks are those religious, co little tiny religious comics. Of course. Yeah. That have been around since the '70s that you'd find in like bus terminals and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was sort of altering the covers to be funny. <laughs> nice. And and uh, so I did about like a hundred of them right. or so, and I did a whole show of these. And you can order those in bulk, right? Because yeah. if you're interested in like they're only like ten cents a piece. Or something, <laughs> you can order like a case of them. Oh yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so I did about a hundred of them, and we did like a whole gallery show of them, and uh, apparently some religious people found out about it, and they were uh, picketing in front of the store, which is equivalent of, I think, winning the Academy Award, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting protesters at, at your art show. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> so... Uh did you get any pictures with any of the protesters? Oh yeah, I got some pro not with them, but oh. I got pictures of them. <laughs> Did they know who you were? Did they have no. like, pictures? No. I heard that I, the reason that they were there, the rumor that I heard was that um, the week before at Comic-Con, I don't know if you've noticed, but at Comic-Con they have those protesters yeah. over the last couple of years. Somebody went up to one of the protesters and handed them the flyer for my art show and said like, oh. hey man, this, you gotta do something about this. Oh really? And so, yeah. <laughs> and, th and they did. And they did. <laughs> did it uh, affect your sales, positive or negative? I have no idea. I mean, I, I think I sold pretty well because yeah. I was selling them pretty cheap. Yeah. But I don't know if it was because the protesters were out there or not. Yeah. <laughs> but it definitely made it exciting. Ah, I would guess. I remember also seeing, like, uh, Ivan Brunetti stuff uh -huh. back and uh, thinking that was pretty extreme until I ran across your stuff. Uh -huh. and Phil, do, you, do you know Ivan at all? I don't know him, yeah. but I, I remember seeing his stuff and it was it was, it was was one of those things that it was cool to see his stuff during that period of time because he was another one of the few people that was doing edgy humor Yeah. Um, in that sort of era of like serious autobio liter, literary uh, comics. Yeah. So it was heartening to see, like, oh, here's somebody else who's doing it. I, I'm not the only person out there that's, you know, stuck doing this stuff. Nice. There was only a few. There was there was uh, there was me. Um, Mike Diana was around that same time. Yeah. Um, Ivan Brunetti. Uh, Sam Henderson was another. Uh, a big influence on me as yeah, far as like I could uh, see a little bit of Sam Henderson sort of like his kind of like style, crazy yeah. nonsensy kind of jokes and stuff his yeah. books were sort of a revelation at the time too because it yeah. was sort of like wow you know comics I've never 
it had been a long time, probably since I had seen Life in Hell when I was in high school. Like up until that point, I probably never laughed out loud at a comic until yeah. I saw Magic Whistle at that point, which like yeah. you know, ten, fifteen years later. Yeah, the, I could see like a similarity in in like a subtle way between your work and Sam Henderson, like in a kind of like the the fast line, the kind of like uh -huh. you know, and and also a kind of like a, an influence in kind of like maybe like a classic, like almost like animated cartoon, like sensibility, like that kind of like 60s influence. I don't know if that's uh, is something that is uh, actually an influence, but it feels like you guys maybe were influenced by similar things. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're both sort of like big comic book geeks and fans. He's, he's probably more of an encyclopedia of comic book history than, than I'll ever be. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh. That's cool. So do you have, like, plans for future projects? Are you thinking about the next thing, or are you kind of focused on the Nickelodeon show right Pretty now? Pretty much just the Nickelodeon thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I do have, I do have dreams of, like, one day getting a show that's like my own stuff yeah. that, that's not um, I'm not writing for somebody else's art gotcha um, and something that would be more adult mm. gotcha. I think that would I mean that would probably pay less but it would probably be more fun to do something that was more adult ori oriented yeah do you have any other are you, do you have any time to work on comics now that you're working on the show I sort of because I have one more prison pit book to do yeah. And I sort of chip away at it when I can, yeah. but, um, you know, I uh, I only I, I only do it when I can do it. You know, yeah. with the TV, the the sure. TV schedule is crazy. Well, the TV stuff, right? It's kids, it's comedy, it's writing jokes, right? Uh -huh. the prison pits, like, definitely like a kind of more sophisticated, adulty weirdo, almost like an art book in a way at least that's the way I perceive it like it's not as much like gags it's not like well no it wasn't intended to be gags like it was supposed yeah. to be well, it was intended to be taken seriously like I approach yeah. it seriously yeah and if there's comedy in that then in the same way that like when you're watching wrestling and you see yeah, yeah. you know the wrestler get in front of the mic and he starts trash talking the other wrestler yeah. He's fucking serious, but you're yeah. laughing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Because what he's saying is hilarious, but he's fucking dead serious. So I wanted to sort of achieve that. Uh, whatever that is, I wanted to achieve that with Prison Pit. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to take it seriously. I wanted it to be dark and creepy and kind of get under your skin. It wasn't intended to be sort of funny in the same way that uh, Angry Youth Comics was funny. Yeah, well, I think you succeeded. Oh, yeah. thank you. But uh, you brought up wrestling. Are you a fan of wrestling? Um, yeah, sometimes. I don't watch it as much as I used to, yeah. simply because I don't have the time. Yeah. But I'm sure that if if I did, I would easily get back into it. Right on. The uh, I was a big wrestling fan in my youth. We recently got asked to. Uh, come up with a take on a show for WWE and uh -huh. it was uh, a camp they were like it's wrestlers at camp so I was like okay send me the thing and I'll go out on this and then I'll ask you for some stuff but basically the short story is I pitched a, they didn't have a concept so I pitched Vince McMahon as a combination like a runner of a Nazi concentration <laughs> camp slash a slave owner on a southern plant plantation uh huh and uh, they loved it. Apparently, Vince McMahon was like, "This is great. I know how to play a villain." You know, whatever. But they ultimately didn't uh, didn't move forward with it. But I was uh, happy to see that he had a sense of humor about himself. Anyway, that would have been good. I want to see um, Nazi <laughs> concentration. WWF's Nazi concentration camp. Yeah, so plantation. Forget, yeah, don't forget plantation slave owner. <laughs> but um, so uh, yeah. Uh, well, I guess we're going to wrap it up, and this is, uh, I'll ask if you want to plug anything, or? Um, you can follow me on various social medias, I guess. 
right. And what does he get? The, what's the one of them uh, instant grams or something? Instant grams, yeah. tweeter, yeah. Uh, facial books. Right on. All of them. All right. Well, thanks so much for Thank you. participating in this weird thing. I hope, <laughs> hope you enjoyed it. There's JJ enjoyed it, clearly. That's cool. All right. Well, right on, man. Thank thanks. you. Cheers. Clink. Clink. Tongue and pencil. We did it. Awesome.